What a decision. It's incredible the movie The Passion of the Christ. It's been out for since 2004, 2005. I went with Arthur to the movie theaters and he passed away in the spring of five, wasn't it? Around now in five. 2005. So this movie came out in either four or late early five. And it's an amazing movie and I love using pictures from it and clips from it and stuff like that. But this guy, Pilate, what a interesting guy. I've preached on Pilate a handful of times because he's it's an interest he's an interesting character. But Susan and I have been watching a lot of um, archaeology stuff on online, and archaeology of Israel is just fascinating. I, I've always been fascinated by archaeology. I, I love looking at the history. I have. Personally, I don't have too much desire to go to Israel, but I'm very interested in other people going and showing me what they found. And this is one of the people that has very little archaeological evidence that's been found. And yet, he's a very real character that was there and a very important role at Christ's crucifixion. Matthew 27, verses 11 to 26. Now Jesus was standing before Pilate, the Roman governor. Are you the king of the Jews? The governor asked him. And Jesus replied, you have said it. But when the leading priests and the elders made their accusations against him, Jesus remained silent. Don't you hear these charges they bringing against you? Pilate demanded, but Jesus made no response to any of the charges, much to the governor's surprise. Now, it was the governor's custom each year during the Passover to celebration to release one prisoner to the crowd, a man named Barabbas, which actually in the Greek, that says Jesus Barabbas. So they're both actually named Jesus. As the crowd gathered before Pilate's house that morning, he asked them, which one do you want me to release? This Jesus or this Jesus? That they call the Messiah. He knew very well that the religious leaders had arrested Jesus out of, out of envy. Just then, as Pilate was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent him a message. Leave that innocent man alone. I suffered through a terrible nightmare about him last night. Meanwhile, the leading priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas to be released and for Jesus to be put to death. So the governor asked again, which of these two do you want me to release to you? And the crowd shouted back, Barabbas. Pilate responded, then what should I do with Jesus called the Messiah? They shouted back, crucify him. But why, he demands, what crime has he committed? But the mob roared even louder, crucify him. Pilate saw he was, wasn't getting anywhere and that the riot was developing. So he sent for a bowl of water and he washed his hands before the crowd saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. The responsibility is yours. And the people yelled back, we will take the responsibility for his death, we and our children. So Pilate released Barabbas to them, and he ordered Jesus to be flogged with a lead-tipped whip, and then turned him over to the Roman soldiers to be crucified. Heavenly Father, as we look at this passage, we look at who this Pilate guy was and his interaction with Jesus, I pray, Lord God, you open our eyes to you and how great you are. Jesus, in your precious name, amen. This thing on the screen, it looks like just a discarded brick that fell off of something, which is actually what it is. But what the, the, the whole big deal about this is, is in 1961, they found this thing. And people like to complain. People like to find, find issue with stuff within the Word of God. People like to stand there and say, well, because we can't find this, clearly that didn't happen. Well, there was very little, actually no, archaeological evidence that Pilate existed. There was nothing. 
And in those days, it was common for Roman leaders to have their name carved into everything during the time that they were a leader. There were historical evidence. There were people that wrote down history in, on scrolls, but there was no written in stone, literally, evidence of his existence. So people were saying, well, because there's no written in stone evidence of Pilate's existence, he clearly didn't exist, and people just wrote it down just to be able to make the Bible look right. And since Pilate didn't exist, clearly Jesus didn't exist, right? And if Jesus didn't exist, well, then his sacrifice didn't happen. If his sacrifice didn't happen, there's no need for, for Christianity, and therefore Christianity doesn't exist. This is the reasoning that people take. When there's no proof of Pilate, Pilate didn't have him put to death, Jesus didn't die, which means he didn't raise from the dead, which means there is no salvation for you. That's, their, that's their, the way they go. 1961, one of the greatest discoveries was this tablet because it shut down a debate that was happening. Personally, I believe Jesus came up, I don't need that tablet, but there are people at debate saying that they need this tablet. So according to the historical documents outside of Scripture, Pilate was an incredibly cruel man. He was, he was a tyrant. In Luke chapter 13, we actually see that a report comes to Jesus of something that Pilate had done before Jesus was even crucified, obviously because before he was crucified. About this time, Jesus was informed that Pilate had murdered some people in Galilee as they were offering sacrifices at the temple. A protest was rising up. The Jews tended to be unruly. And for Pilate to calm it down, he went right into the temple and he slaughtered people in the temple while they were trying to do their sacrifices. He had caused so much death in the time that he was the leader that Rome actually had gotten to the point that said to him, that you need to get these protests under control. So many times the Jews would rise up and then he would try to calm it down and he couldn't do it. So he just kept killing people. He just kept killing them in groups to try to get them under control. And Israel and Rome was so upset with the way it was that they finally said, if you have any more uprisings, it'll be a ticket to your own death. There's one event in history where it says that there was such an issue and such an uprise and so much of a problem that he actually herded a whole group of people into an amphitheater and he threatened to cut all of their heads off. But they knew that if he'd done another mass killing, that Rome would take him out. So they actually bared their necks and said, go ahead, we dare you. In AD 36, he massacred such a huge number of Samaritans that he was removed from office. In, 19, in AD 38, his, was his death was recorded. He was the pilot of, of Rome. He was, the pilot, he was the governor of Judea from AD 26 to AD 36. In 10 years, he caused all kinds of issues. He killed I had a lot of people killed, and he just had one uprise after another after another. So there's Jesus, he comes along, and there's a mob forming outside his house, and he has to settle this thing down. Because keep in mind, Jesus was actually, the, 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 the timing of our calendar is wrong. So Jesus actually died, not on AD 33, but closer to this date. So this was, he'd been, he'd been governor for a while by the time Jesus was put to death. So he'd already gotten in trouble a few times by the time the Roman, the, before this mob showed up at Pilate's front door. And those religious leaders knew full well that, that Pilate was on thin ice with Rome. So they knew full well that they'd be able to sway him into doing what they want done simply by causing a bit of a kerfuffle in town because they knew that Pilate would get into trouble for not calming it down. And then you have the Passover weekend. They say about two million people would descend upon Jerusalem during Passover weekend. 
So Pilate would have already been on edge. Two million people are sitting in town. Two million extra people, not just the people that, that's on top of the people that were already there. Two million visitors are showing up into Israel that weekend. So he's got all of that going on and a mob now forming in front of his house saying crucify, put to death a completely innocent person. He would have already had his hands on, had his hands full. We know that it was common for people to go. When Jesus was a kid, they used to go every year. According to Luke chapter 2, verse 41 to 42, every year Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. When Jesus was 12 years old, they attended the festival as usual. And then, of course, they left him behind and they lost him. They had one job. One job. Take care of the Messiah. And they lost the kid in the, in the city. They had to go back. They found him. He was, he was all right. He was fine. He was just teaching the lead of religious leaders how to be religious leaders. He would have been so much on edge with all these extra people, and then the religious leaders caused all this problem. Pilate was a cold and calculating man, and he's standing there, and he's stuck in the middle of a decision that he needed to make. Pilate would have known full well that Jesus came into town to great fanfare only a few days earlier. He would have known full well about the triumphal entry because it says in Matthew 21, verses 8 to 11, most of the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him and the others cut branches of trees and spread them on the road. Jesus was in the center of the procession and all the people around him were, were shouting, praise God for the son of David. Blessings to the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise God in the highest heavens. The entire city of Jerusalem was in an uproar as he entered. Who is this, they asked. And the crowds replied, it is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. The entire city was aware that Jesus of Nazareth, the Messiah, entered the city. There is no way that Pilate... If he didn't see it happen, he most certainly would have had it reported to him that that had happened only a few days earlier. He knew full well that this had just gone on. He knew that there was a crowd of people that were big time supporters of him. And remember, there's two million extra people in town. They all come from the surrounding towns. They come from, from Judea, from Galilee. They come from all over the, all over Israel. All of these people that were the feeding of the 5,000, some of them were there. Some of the people who, who saw Jesus raise Jairus' kid from the dead, there would have been some there. People that saw Jesus teaching the Beatitudes, some of them would have been there. People that saw, because people that, that had Jesus come into town and all the sick were healed, they would have been there. These two million people, a lot of them would have been supporters of Jesus. And they would have been excited that he was there. But now you have a crowd calling for his death. So then you've got to have the ones that are jealous of Jesus. You've got to have the crowd that would have been upset that things were changing. The ones that, that sided with the religious leaders. Ones that were afraid of being locked out of the locked out of the temple of being allowed to go and worship because you can be assured that's the kind of thing the religious leaders were doing. If you don't side with us, we'll ban you from the temple. Jesus, Jesus healed the blind man and when they asked who did this, the parents were afraid of the religious leaders. They were more afraid of the religious leaders than they were in happiness over their son who was born blind was healed, and they sided with the religious leaders over their own kid. So you get these two crowds, those for Jesus, one of those against Jesus, and Pilate stuck in the middle. He was in a lose-lose situation. So he stands there and he calls out to the crowd, what do you want me to do with this guy? And they're calling for his death. He's like, why? There's nothing wrong with him. What crime has he committed? And they don't care what the crime is. They want him crucified. He wasn't getting anywhere with them. And he wanted to be innocent of his blood. But the problem is, you can't be innocent of somebody's blood if you're having them put to death. 
Pilate brings him in and wants to have a chat with him, wants to find out who is this guy? Who is this guy that the people celebrated his entry into the city? When Jesus came into the city, they had more fanfare than, a, than when a king arrives because the king had arrived. And he arrived as a conquering king on a donkey. And Pilate would have been told about this. How many times had Pilate left the city and returned to very little fanfare? And this guy shows up and everybody's up in an uproar. Twenty-seven verse eleven. Now Jesus was standing before Pilate, the Roman governor. Are you the king of the Jews? The governor asked him, and Jesus replied, "You have said it." In other words, "Yep, that's me." Are you the king of the Jews? Good follow-up questions would have been, "Well, where's your kingdom? Where's your throne? Who's in charge? Who's your who's your subjects?" But Jesus backs Pilate right into a corner. Are you the king of the Jews? Yes, I am. And then refused to answer any more questions. And he just stood there in silence and just did a staring contest. In silence. He's making Pilate have to make a decision. Can you imagine what was going through Pilate's mind in the midst of all of this? I got an innocent man that half the city wants to put on a throne and the other half wants him put to death. He's going to have an uproar. Which side does he want to have the uproar with? The ones that are for him or the ones that are against him? How many times had Pilate been the judge over a case? How many times had Pilate sat there and listened to two people argue? We had, young, we had some kids having a little bit of a meltdown this week, didn't run up the main street on us. That was kind of nice. Um, but we had two kids throwing snowballs and stuff like that during the walk and take them off to the side and okay, what's going on? And they're just yelling at each other and they're both, you know, different stories. You know, neither one of them can be right. They can't both be right, and both be wrong at the same time. You're listening to them and you're just like, but all I know is I saw a snow being thrown and you both were doing it. All I know is, the, and finally you're just like, you need to please just stay away from, because they're always wrestling with each other. Please just Stay away from each other for the night. Just, just stay away from each other. Let's just have, a, have an evening where there isn't any wrestling and one of them crying and running up the stairs here is going to go home. Oh, you can't go home yet. And, you know, <sighs> you sit down and talk to them for a little while. They defended themselves. They both defended themselves. And I even had some of the youth leaders come over and say, okay, so what happened? And then they explained it. Like, you can't keep your eyes on 45 kids all at the same time, all... My goal is that we get from the school to here with nobody getting run over. So you got to ask one of the leaders, so what happened? So then you find out from the leaders what happened, and then you got to go back to the kid, and then the story's different. They defended themselves. Jesus was not defending himself. Jesus was just standing there silently looking at him. The, the, the religious leaders are standing there accusing Jesus, defending themselves, and Jesus just stood there. And Pilate says, don't you hear the charges they're bringing against you? But Jesus made no any chant, no response. He stood there in silence. This would have never happened in the time that Pilate had been, had been the governor. People are always wanting to defend themselves. You ever, had, you ever had a conversation with somebody and you know they're wrong and they know they're wrong but they're in too deep at this point so they're defending themselves even when they know they're wrong but they still want to just keep going because they're, they're just doubling down on the situation? They know they're wrong. They even admit that they know they're wrong but they just keep going with it. He'd be used to that. He'd be used to people doubling down and, 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 and arguing themselves. We had an incredible conversation on, um, on Thursday before the BG Club started, sitting in the chairs over here, three of the youth and me, and one of them says, I was reading something the other day. Was there a baby cut in half in the Bible? I said, well, no. Solomon offered to cut the baby in half. Because one of them's died. Yes, that's right. One of them died, and the other one, well, isn't that disgusting? Isn't that gross? Well, yes, it would be. 
Well, why did he offer that? Well, because it helped him know who the right parent was. He was a very smart man. God gave him incredible wisdom. And that started out an incredible conversation that kept going and going and going, which I bring up in a minute. But it was incredible. But these two women both defended themselves. They both had something to say. They both pleaded their case. Jesus did not plead his case. He stood there in absolute silence. And I think what's amazing about all of this, Jesus stood there in this court case, in this time in the judgment seat. At this time, he stood there in absolute silence. But the neat thing is, next time Jesus was standing in a court of law, he did a whole bunch of talking because he was the advocate speaking on behalf of, I'm going to say, probably the, the, the prisoner that was crucified next to him because he says, today you'll be with me in paradise. Jesus stood there in absolute silence defending himself, but the next time he stood in a court of law, he certainly did a lot of talking, but he wasn't defending himself. He was defending you. He was defending your sins to be forgiven. He was giving reasons why you should be forgiven. You were guilty, and yet he stood up there and said, I'll take the payment for them. When it came to defending himself, he didn't say a word, but when it comes to defending you, he's certainly going to do a whole bunch of talking, and you will be let off of your, of your punishment because of his death. 1 John 2, 1. My dear children, I'm writing this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. He didn't defend himself, but he's going to defend you. Isn't that neat? Amazing. Amazing. Thank you, Lord. Pilate and all the historical documents is listed as being one of the most ruthless, merciless tyrants that, that led the people. And yet, here he is standing there wanting to help Jesus. He's saying, just give me something to work with. Give me a reason to let you go. He didn't even want to have Jesus flogged. He's like, just give me a reason to take to the crowd. Just, just give me a, drop me a bone, do something. John 19, 4. Pilate went outside again. He said to the people, I'm going to bring him out to you now. But understand, I find him not guilty. Verse 8 to 11 of John 19. Then Pilate heard this and he was frightened. He was more frightened than ever. He took Jesus back to the headquarters, back into the headquarters again, and he says, where are you from? But Jesus gave no answer. Why don't you talk to me? Pilate demanded. Don't you realize I have the power to release you or to crucify you? And then Jesus speaks. You have no power over me unless it was given to you from above. So the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. So when Jesus finally does talk, he, he kind of like insults him. He says, you got no power over me. God the Father has the power here. And the ones that are guilty of this are the ones standing outside. And Pilate knew full well why Jesus was brought before him, because the religious leaders were jealous. We find that out in Matthew 27, verse 18. They were jealous, and he knew that. He knew he had an innocent man. He knew it was jealousy. He knew the religious leaders were a bunch of misfits. But what was he supposed to do? And the most ludicrous, crazy confusing, frustrating part of all of this are the religious leaders in the midst of it all. They are worried about going into Pilate's um, courtroom because they didn't want to make themselves unclean and not be able to celebrate the Passover. Uh, verse 28, John 18, 28. Jesus' trial before Caiaphas ended early in the morning. Then they... Then he was taken to the headquarters of the Roman governor. His accusers didn't go inside because it would defile them. 
and they wouldn't be allowed to celebrate the Passover. They have no idea. They are so worried about going into a Gentile's home that would defile them from being able to celebrate the Passover, yet they don't pick up on the fact that they have bribed Judas to bear false witness. One of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not lie. They have asked for an innocent man to be put to death, thou shalt not kill. They are incredibly jealous and coveting Jesus' ministry, thou shalt not covet. Three, three commandments blatantly being broken as they stand there. Blatantly. And yet, they're worried about getting unclean and can't celebrate the Passover. They had no reason, no right to be doing the Passover. I'm quite curious. Did one of them get to go in behind the curtain when the curtain finally got ripped open anyways? Did they go in behind the curtain? Did they, all, did they make it out alive after that? They're worried about being unclean, but they're not picking up on the fact that three of the commandments are being broken in the midst of all of this. They don't even get it. They don't even see it. They don't even comprehend it. So Pilate's trying to figure out, how do I sway the crowd? How do I get these people to, to give up on this? How do I get the people to, to come back over onto my side? And so he thinks, okay, I'm going to do something sneaky. I'll release the, the, the most notorious prisoner we got sitting in the prison right now. See, a lot of the scholars believe that there were going to be three crucifixions that day. The two that we heard about on either side of Jesus and the other Jesus, Barabbas. The crosses were all set. They were already ready to go. They were already ready to, all the, the, the crew was there to drag out these guys to put them up on the crosses anyways. So he thinks, okay, I'm going to crucify this guy because nobody likes him. He's a notorious murderer, sinner, thief in town. Nobody would want him. He thinks, okay, I'll, 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 offer, I'll offer them. They have to choose between this guy that they would never want released into their city again. And this guy, who really hasn't done anything wrong. He's trying to show them the difference between an innocent man and a true criminal. He's trying to show them what it means to be the son of God who was without sin, spotless, without blemish, and a true criminal. I grew up in Hamilton at the time that... that Paul Bernardo killed those kids. I lived through a friend, a, the, the girl I was dating, her friend was one of the kids. Kristen French was her friend. We knew that she went missing. They found her body. We lived through that. As I didn't know Kristen myself, but the girl I was dating, her dad was a lawyer and Kristen French's dad was a lawyer and they worked in the law offices together and they used to hang out together and she went missing. Barabbas, in my mind, is a Paul Bernardo. He raped 16 little kids, or teen, teens and younger kids, 16. He put three of them to death. It'd be like bringing Jesus forward and saying, do you want him released, or do you want this animal released? And they said, let the murderer free and have access to our little girls again. Put Jesus to death. That's the kind of decision that he gave them. He brought the worst one he had in the prison forward and said, you got, this is what a real criminal looks like, and look at him. What are you doing? And they said, we'll take our chances with the, with the rapist, murderer, thief. Put Jesus to death. Pilate would have been just, just so confused. Now he's got a crowd on his hands that want Jesus put to death. He's got to put an innocent man to death, and he's just released the most hardened criminal he's got into the city. Like, it just kept getting worse and worse and worse as it goes. And he's just releasing a rapist, murderer, thief into the city. And you think you have bad days. And then on top of all of that, 
He's trying to figure out what to do. And his wife starts nagging at him. I had a dream last night. Leave the man alone. He's innocent. Please leave him alone. In the middle of all of this, she shows up. So he gave the people time to think, figure this has got to sink in. Nobody's going to want to Barabbas let go. Nobody's going to. They gotta, they're going to come to their senses. So he gives them a chance to think about that. He goes inside. His wife comes and talks to him. He realizes he's in bigger trouble than he, than he thought it was. The spirit realm's actually telling him to, 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 to sort this thing out. He goes walking back. He goes figuring, okay, good. They're going to have this thing sorted out. Brings Barabbas. Brings Jesus. Says, okay, which one do you want? And they say they want Barabbas. <sighs> That's control of a mob. Imagine the feeling in poor Pilate's stomach at this point. It says that it says in, in one of the passages I read a moment ago that he was even more frightened. This is a guy that 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 killed mob groups of people at a time. This is a guy that was ruthless and and had people executed just just for the sake of doing it. He was known as being one of the most ruthless leaders that they had, and he was afraid. The pressure he must have been under. But did you realize that every day this decision is made in every single person's heart? Every day people have to choose to either embrace sin or embrace forgiveness. Every single day we need to decide, am I going to embrace the sin and let it run rampant in my life? Or do I embrace Jesus and accept him and accept what he has done for me? Which one do I choose? How often have I chosen between the flesh and the spirit? How many times have I decided I'm gonna follow the king of righteousness? Or do I plunge into the sin? How many times have I been given that choice between the sin and the Savior? And I've chosen the sin over the Savior. How many times? There goes a story about this Jewish man and this Christian who would play chess every single, every once a week. They sit down and they play chess and they would, they would talk about Christ and they would talk about the Jewish faith and they would go back and forth talking about what each other believed and neither one of them would accept the other one's beliefs. For years they would play chess, week after week after week and they would talk and they would talk and they would talk. But then the Jewish man became very, very ill. And the Christian man went to the hospital to visit him and they're talking away. And during that visit, the Jewish man, they knew he was going to die. And the Jewish man brought up the conversation about Christianity again. And he pointed out to the Christian something he never picked up on. He says, you remember the part about when Jesus was on trial and the crowd had to choose between Barabbas and Jesus? I've decided to choose Barabbas. I've chosen to release Barabbas and let Jesus die. Because one of us has to die for my sin. And if I let Jesus free, then he wouldn't have gone to the cross. I realize that I am Barabbas. And I cannot take my sin to the grave. So I will release myself and I'll let Jesus take my place. And he chose for Jesus to be his Messiah and chose for Jesus to take his place on the cross rather than going himself. I am no better than Barabbas. I am guilty of the sin that I was born in. And I deserve death. Jesus was, was innocent. And he was worthy of life. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For God made Christ who never sinned to be an offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. Jesus deserved life. He's the only one that's ever existed that deserved life. 
yet he got the death. Barabbas deserved death, but he was given life. I deserve death, but I have been given life. Did you know that in this day, they believed that dreams came from the spirit realm? They believed that it was the small g, gods, speaking to them? That was a common belief. That was very common in the Roman world. So when she went and interrupted him, keep in mind, marriages are a little different in those days. But even today, if you had the Supreme Court sitting, hearing a case, the spouse of one of the Supreme Court judges, if they sent a message or tried to get a hold of the judge, they would have had to wait until the recess so they could have the conversation. She interrupted him on the throne with a mob outside and an innocent man being tried. She interrupted him. She could be put to death for doing that. Do you remember when, when Esther wanted to talk to the king? You don't just go and interrupt them in those days. She interrupted him saying, leave this man alone. Because it says just then, as Pilate was sitting on the judgment seat, he hadn't come inside to use the bathroom or get a drink. He's sitting on the judgment seat. His wife sent him a message, leave the innocent man alone. I suffered through a terrible nightmare about him last night. So not only does Pilate know that this man is innocent, now the spirit realm is echoing into his, into his heart. Leave this man alone. He's so confused, he's overwhelmed, he's frustrated. This would have pushed him so much to think about this. Pilate knew that his life depended on shutting down this mob. But he would have also known there was a mob only a few days earlier that's in support of him. This is early in the morning. That mob might still be in bed. What happens when that mob finds out that Jesus has been put to death? Are they going to rise up instead? He knew he was about to do a major wrong, but he didn't know how to fix it. Three people announced that Jesus was innocent in this event. You got Judas. He tells the priests, guys, this is an innocent man. He tells the ones that are accusing Jesus, this is an innocent man. You can't do this. You have Pilate's wife saying, this is an innocent man. You can't do this. And then you have the centurion. This is the guy that was in charge of the crucifixion. This wasn't just a random, a random guard that was there. This is the guy that was supposed to re report back saying the job is done. He puts Jesus to death, or Jesus is already dead. He takes that thing and shoves it into Jesus' side, and he realizes, uh-oh, this was an innocent man because the spirit realm spoke when that water and blood flowed. He knew that he just stabbed an innocent man and he put an innocent man to death because according to their stuff, they would have known, oh no. In every angle, they should have known not to have done this, but, in the, but the Lord wanted this done. It needed to be done. And Pilate looks over the crowd and he asks a simple question before he sends Jesus off. A simple question, what should I do with him? I have not had to speak out over a crowd very many times. I have not had to deal with a mob. I've never had to deal with a riot on my hands. But if I've learned anything from Scripture, you don't ask the people that are rioting what they want. When Moses was about to cross the Red Sea, the people wanted to go back to Egypt. And Moses was like, no, we're going across the water. And over they go. The crowd was afraid to go into the promised land and the people listened to them and they wouldn't go into the promised land. 40 years they hung out in the desert where well, they could have been there 40 years earlier but no, the crowd wanted to do it this way. You don't ask the crowd. When, when Elijah was on Mount Carmel and he was standing there about to take on the, 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 the priests of Baal, they all were all against 
Elijah, you don't listen to the crowd. You never listen to the crowd. The crowd is always wrong. But, uh, but Pilate took the easy way out. He listened to the crowd that was standing there before him at that time. And he tried to put as much, he tried to remain as much neutral as he possibly could. He tried to remain as neutral as he could. He wanted to decide not to decide. So this past Thursday that really got me thinking, there was a conversation sitting over here. It started out with the part about Solomon and the baby. And the conversation just kept going and going and get, kept getting deeper and deeper as they went. They wanted to know about, about um, the Catholic Church and what do they believe. They wanted to know what do the Mormons believe, what do the Mennonites believe. What do the Mennonites believe? What do we believe? What is our view on women in ministry? What is the view on, on, um, on this thing with Solomon? And what's this thing about sin, being born in sin? I'm thinking, these guys have been in our program since they were in kindergarten. The Catholics believe, and like they've been reading stuff on Google, reading all kinds of stuff. It's like it was so fascinating to listen to them talking about this, and it made me feel so good that they've been, now the Lord is really working in their hearts that they're at home researching this stuff. The Catholics believe that we're born in sin, you have to be baptized. Do you guys baptize babies? And one of them was reading a thing about a person that had been baptized as a baby and they were really upset that their parents had them baptized because they didn't feel that they should have been baptized. It should have been their choice. And I said, and that's why we baptize adults, but we dedicate babies and do the baptism later when they can choose. And he said, well, so how does this born in sin thing work? I'm like, so then I asked them questions. I said, well, where did the sin come from? Well, Adam and Eve. I said, so how did it all Come up, come up, be. Well, it came to be because they, you know, he, she ate the apple and his, you know, stuff like this. I said, yeah. So the sin came into the world. They got kicked out of, kicked out of the um, garden, and now you have sin that's here, and we're all born in that sin. And um, I said, we all need to make a decision. We need to decide whether or not we want to serve the Lord. We, want, we need to decide whether we're going to give Jesus our sin or we're going to keep it for ourselves because when we die, we're going to have to answer for that. And one of them said, what if I decide I don't want to decide? What if I say no to deciding? I said, well, you're still deciding. You're deciding not to decide. A decision not to decide is a decision that you're choosing to reject. And then when you stand before Jesus, he's going to show you the decision that you made of deciding not to decide because the decision not to decide is to decide not to, not to go with Jesus. So you have decided. If you say no to salvation, if you say no to Jesus, he will point that out to you and he will show you your opportunity that you had and the many times you've had that opportunity. You can't decide not to decide. Pilate wanted to decide not to decide. You don't have an opportunity to decide not to decide. So then later on in, in, in youth, then we had to go to the school, so the conversation came to an end. Then during youth, I was on devotions, and I brought the conversation back up so we could keep going with it. Two of them weren't there at that point. They had to leave early. But we continued the conversation. And one of them says, what if you get to heaven and one of the people that's a real jerk that's been treating you really badly all this time is there and they're going to just keep doing it? I said, well, okay. And my mom watches this, I'm sorry. I said, my grandfather was a loser. She would use a much more colorful word than that. He was a loser. And he was an alcoholic his entire life. Well, I guess in his late teens, he became an alcoholic. He was an alcoholic right through till the day he got saved. 50 years of marriage. He was mean. He was, he was rude. He would push my mom around. He'd push my aunt around. He would push my grandmother around. He used to push the dog around. 
which was really quite funny when I said that. All of them were like, oh, not the dog. I'm like, wait, you're okay with them pushing everybody else around, but the dog is the line? We all had a good laugh. I said, he was terrible. Every time they'd have $10, he'd spend it on booze rather than putting it towards the household expenses. He was a horrible man. But he got saved just when it was around their 50th anniversary, he got saved. And he quit drinking. There was some damage that had been done there. He wasn't the same guy. Then he quickly had a stroke. You can have every theory you want. Probably the lack of alcohol. His blood wasn't as thin as it used to be, and he had a stroke, and he ended up in the hospital with a stroke. So he went from a drunk that we didn't really know anything what he was like, except somebody you stayed out of his way of, to being actually somebody you seemed actually somewhat like somebody that would, could be a little bit interesting, to being stroked out in the hospital for four more years, not knowing who anybody is that came in to visit him, unable to get out of bed, and un <laughs> physically, he kept living. And if you put food in front of him, he opened his mouth, you put food in, and it came out the other end. So he just kept living on and on and on and on, and finally had enough strokes, he finally passed away. That guy, I believe, because he asked Jesus to be his Lord, and he was delivered from the alcoholism, and then he had the stroke. I'm going to get to go to heaven, and after I've had some wonderful time with Jesus, I'm going to get to meet my grandfather. And the guy that was a loser for my mom and my aunt growing up and treated my grandmother terribly for 50 whatever years, that's not going to be the guy that we're going to get to meet. The guy my grandmother fell in love with when they were younger, the guy that actually, he worked in the, he was in the Navy. His job was to be the guy that, that listened to the Morse code and he would write it down and he would take the messages to the captain of the ship and the captain would then give the message back and he would then send it as Morse code out. That takes a little bit of brains to be able to hear that and write it out. He actually was the first one on his ship to find out that the, that the Second World War was over. He got the message and he had to carry that message to the captain. The captain would read it over, find out what it was, and then would have to tell all the officers and then they would finally announce it to the whole ship. He knew that the war was over before his captain knew. He knew the war was over before most people knew because he got the message before they could announce that this was over. There must have been some brains in there. The guy that I'm going to get to meet isn't going to be the guy that I saw when I was a child. It's going to be the guy that God made originally before all the alcohol caused all that trouble. That's going to be the guy. So when you get to heaven, you're not going to have to worry about somebody being mean to you because all of those parts of who people are, those parts that caused people to be the way they were, if they ask Jesus to be their Lord and Savior and they are saved and they get to go to heaven because of Jesus, asking Jesus to forgive them of their sins and accepting his blood, only the best parts of who they are is what's going to be there. And that's who you're going to get to spend eternity with. So your worst enemy might be your best friend. That's the grandfather I'm looking forward to getting to see. I love conversations like that with the kids because they ask all kinds of follow-up questions. They don't even let you finish your thought before they're asking the next question. And you just, because those are the things that are burning in their hearts and they're sitting there reading on Google as to what, what does this mean and what happens with that and how does this work? But you need to decide if you're gonna decide. But if you decide not to decide, you've decided. And Pilate was trying to decide not to decide. And the reality is, regardless of what Pilate's decision was, Jesus was going to his death that day because before the foundations of this earth was made, before that tree that was grown, that was carved into a cross, before that tree, before the tree that made the, 
seed that created the tree, that started the tree that Jesus was hung on, before that tree even was grown long enough to be able to have another seed to be able to grow the next tree which carved into a cross, before all that was happened, it was determined that Jesus was, it was decided Jesus was going to the cross that day on that tree for your sins. And as Jesus stood there and looked at Pilate and said, you got no control over my life. Because according to the New Testament, Jesus started us all this stuff. And the cool thing is, Jesus is standing there saying, I was in on the conversation about my death long before I even started this earth spinning, dude. On the earthly side, the religious leaders are the ones that are held accountable here. Pilate was just a tool in the toolbox. Jesus went to the cross because you needed to be forgiven of your sins. Jesus went to the cross so that you could spend eternity with your heavenly Father. <coughs> Did Jesus die because of the religious leaders bringing him to Pilate? No, Jesus died because of my sin. For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. That's why he went to that cross. That's what this is all about. That's why this happened. As Caiaphas, the high priest, said, it's better that one man should die for the people. And Jesus did that. He went and he died for the people. Pilate stood there and said, I want to be innocent of this man's blood. But the truth is, I am innocent because of that man's blood. And it's up to me to decide how I'm going to decide on the greatest decision there is to decide on. And that's to decide to accept Jesus or to reject Jesus. And every one of us has to make that decision, whether we want to or not. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you, God, for all that you are. And I thank you, Lord Jesus, for bring somebody across my path back in my early teens to show me who you were. And I thank you, Lord Jesus, for the opportunity to come to know you, Lord. And I thank you, Jesus, that I know that my grandfather did ask you for, for forgiveness of his sins. And I thank you, Lord Jesus, that the guy that, that we all knew isn't the guy that we're going to know. And I thank you, Jesus, that we will be given new bodies. And I thank you, Jesus, that we will be made new again. And I thank you, Jesus, that the damage and the, and the, the mess and the problems and the, and the sicknesses and the diseases and the self-inflicted injuries of, of, from alcoholism or from whatever, I thank you, Jesus, that that will all be cleaned up all be washed away. And I thank you, Jesus, that nothing but the good will be left. And I thank you, Jesus, that nothing but the, nothing but the, the, the perfect will be left. And I thank you, Jesus, that there won't be any jerks in heaven. There won't be any mean people in heaven. There won't be anybody treating us badly in heaven. They might have been like that when they were here. But that part gets left behind. And I thank you, Jesus. And I pray, God, for those conversations that happen on Thursdays. I pray, Lord Jesus, for these kids as they sit at home and they Google stuff and they're looking this stuff up and they're actually, they were talking at the cafeteria at the school about all this. I pray, Jesus, that you will just, just, Birth these conversations in their hearts, Lord God. Send questions into their minds, Lord God. Just give them just such a 
burning desire to know the answers to these things, Lord. I pray, Lord God, that you just put as much confusion into their minds as you need to to make them ask questions, to make them want to know the answers, and then give the, the boldness to ask the questions to be able to have it as a group conversation, and then give us leaders the wisdom on how to answer those questions so that we can show them who you are and show them your truth. Oh, we thank you, God. We praise you and we give you all the glory this day. Jesus, be high and lifted up. We thank you and praise you, Lord, in your holy and precious name.